Hello, I'm Donna Scale, along with my co-host Tiffany Ross. Welcome to A Time to Dream. We are brought to you by Roaring Lambs Ministries that knows that everybody has a story. And your story is important because God has allowed certain circumstances in your life that you can use for his glory. So through our testimony workshop, we teach you how to effectively share your story. And then we invite you to be on a time to dream and share your story with the world. Or if you're a writer, to submit your story in writing to us so we can publish your story in Stories of Roaring Faith. Look us up online at roaringlambs.org. But today, I'm so excited about today's show. I know you are in for such a treat. When I first heard Judy Kennedy, I mean, I laughed, I cried, I marveled at how God has brought her through some things. And let me ask you this. What do you do when life gets hard? I mean, really hard and painful and the difficulties seem unending. Sometimes we think that we can't take another bad thing, but sometimes we do. Sometimes they're just piled on top of each other. Well, Judy's gonna be excited and so are Tiffany and I to, to share with you how God helps you through any difficult situation. So let me tell you a little bit about Judy. Judy serves, Judy Kennedy serves as co-pastor of Mustang Creek Community Church in Forney, Texas. She and her husband, Robert, have spent 37 of their 39 years of marriage in ministry together. She is a gifted communicator and her credibility comes from life's experience. Her story is one of God's faithfulness and power to overcome even in the darkest moments. Along with an anointed international speaking ministry, she's an exceptional writer. She currently offers parenting and marriage enrichment advice in her column, Just Judy, and often contributes to various blogs, vlogs, and local magazines. And she's also authored five books. I love it. Uh, the first book is called Holy Crap, or you can find it under Divine Dysfunction. Uh, she's written Who Washed the Sky, It's Just Judy, Chasing Legacy, and her latest book, Big Girl Pants. Uh, welcome to A Time to Dream, Judy. We're so excited about this. but well, I'm thrilled to be here. And we want to hear your whole story. So uh, we like to start at the beginning. Okay. So tell us a little bit about your childhood and your early years. Well, I, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I am excited. I, I think a lot of times it's hard for people to hear your story when it is so complicated, so I will try to slow down and focus. Um, I will tell you, I, my story is one of scandalous grace. It's just the overwhelming grace of God that I never deserved that he gave me. I uh, was born into, uh, I was number five of six children in the home of a severe alcoholic. Um, it was very difficult growing up. We lived in absolute chaos and dysfunction and there was a lot of violence and trauma in my childhood. I experienced things that most children should never experience and that today I believe a lot still experience, but it is a, when you're in that situation, it's a sacred secret. It's something you don't want the world to know this is how I really live. And so you mask it and hide it in the schools or maybe even in preschool. As young as I was, my earliest memory was about three or four years old and the trauma that I experienced because my dad would become extremely violent. Of course, alcoholism in the home begets dysfunction, which began to bring in much more distraction and chaos. I saw things I shouldn't see. I experienced things I shouldn't experience. Uh, my dad would become ex extremely incoherent. He would take our plumbing out of our bathroom to fix something and it would be out for weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. So we 
we had no option but maybe to just choose a, a coffee can or something to use the restroom in. Now that affects you, especially if you're a young woman. We had three girls and three boys. Mm -hmm. um, my dad would line us up in the backyard uh, and we would stand there and he would spray us with a water hose and let us pass a bar of soap down so that we could have our bath for the week, but the neighbors got to watch that humiliating experience. And as you go through those things over and over, you know, the police were in our home three times a week. I mean, he, they would come in, check, make sure we were okay. Uh, it was before CPS ex ever existed, and it was a situation where I had to learn, my mom would always offer, now my mom was an ex extreme Christian, so she would always offer, say Jesus, 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 when you're afraid, when you're in trauma, when you can't control the environment, close your eyes and just say the name of Jesus. So I tell people the way that I kept my sanity in that is that I learned to lean in and to say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I, uh, at a very young age, I saw my uh, one brother stabbed 14 times. Uh, and I, it was a drug deal gone bad. I saw one of my brothers on drugs try to run over my mom. I ran out in front of him to stop that from happening. Uh, and he hit a tree. I can tell you the things that I experienced during that season of my life from very early childhood all the way through about 12, 13 years really affected the way I see the world. It developed a fear and anxiety in me that I really had to have the grace of God to overcome. <clears throat> Judy, I, you know, I've heard your story and still my jaw wants to drop on the floor mm -hmm. just because I can't comprehend the trauma that you dealt with as a youngster. You know, here you're this, you know, coherent, beautiful woman sitting across from us by the grace of God. And um, I love that you're going to share more of that with our, our listeners. Um, but you mentioned your mom and the faith that she really instilled in you all. You all were very active in church. And what was the spiritual life like for you? I know that life at home was very chaotic. Was, was church a bit of a respite as a young girl? I think in a lot of ways it was. Uh, mm -hmm. Church became the place that we could hide for safety. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew most of the time, obviously, Dad would never be there. Now, there were times when my dad would come to the church because he was drinking, and he would mm -hmm. come to hear us sing because we all sang, and he would sit on the back row, and he would call out real loud, again, very humbling and embarrassing, you know, that's my girl, you know, they, those wow. kind of things were very challenging for us, but my mom always taught us you can trust in God. Dad is not the devil. It's the devil in the drink. It's the alcohol that's making him. Don't hate your dad. Hate the devil. Mm -hmm. But she would always bring us back to God will get us through. God will be faithful. God will be there. So we had this confusing lifestyle. You know, mom was very strict in her uh, opinions and her conservative values. And my dad was very opposite of that. So he would say one thing, she would say another, and we were kind of sometimes caught in the middle. But the church was a place where I did learn the concepts of the Bible. They had contests and I memorized scripture so I could win the contest. And I remember those fun things mm -hmm. that a lot of times our churches don't realize the children that are coming in are not always coming in from perfect households. Yes. They have that sacred secret that you don't realize what they're coming out of and into. The same with school teachers. I know I'm, I try now, I, I speak with school teachers and explain to them that if that child is falling asleep, it may not be that they're bored with your teaching. It may be that they didn't get any sleep last night. We would be up all night long singing and until my dad would make us sing until it was time to go to school. So there was no sleep and you're in second grade. You're exhausted when you get there, you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is a challenge, but I believe the church is learning to do more, but I feel like we could do more. Mm -hmm. So here you are, you're a, a young teenager now, and obviously as girls do, they, they notice boys mm -hmm. and boys notice them. So uh, tell us about this date. You had a date with a first boy, a uh, first boyfriend. Yes. Uh, what transpired? <clears throat> well, it, it was probably, aside from what I'll share with you a little later, one of the most, if not the most, devastating to my heart experience in my life. Uh, I was, I tell people I was invisible in my home. You know, there's six children, there's all this chaos. So my mom, really, she could only deal with the problems as they came up, and I never was a problem. I tried, a lot of times children of alcoholics will excel 
for attention, like straight A's in school, always the best. I never was a behavior problem. My mom would tell you in our home, I was never an issue. And so I disappeared. I was unseen. And so I felt that way, not only because of self-esteem, but because of the chaos. And I began to feel as a young woman that I was not pretty, that I would never be desired, that no one would ever long to be with me. And uh, at a very young age, at the age of 14, my older sister, who was beautiful, she actually paid a young man at the skating rink to skate with me because I was a wallflower. I just, I just was not flirty or out there, but I, but I longed for attention, just like any other girl would. So she paid this guy to skate with me, and by the end of the night, you know, he had convinced me to go on a date with him. So I had to convince my conservative mom to let me in because I was very mature. She was comfortable allowing me. I really, I strive so hard to urge mothers, please, you're the only one who knows the mental and emotional status of your child and to give them a freedom uncontrolled at such a young age really was risky. Uh, I went, he picked me up um, and we went out. Uh, my dad was drunk, there was a big scene, it was embarrassing, but then we went out and uh, by the end of that night I had been raped and threatened and from then for the next six months I, I dealt with such confusion because I wanted to have a boyfriend and I wanted to be like, but I, no one, there was no one to confide in or tell me what was happening was wrong. Mm -hmm. And what was happening is that I was being more and more abused physically, sexually, emotionally, mentally. In so many ways, I was just being burned down. I was tortured with, um, burned with cigarettes on my arms. I, there were things that happened to me that should, again, never happen, but I kept them secret because my mom had enough pain. Mm -hmm. But my mom did walk in uh, as I was changing clothes and she saw some of the bruises in my body and she began to catch on there's something going on. Immediately she did step in and she uh, got a restraining order. So after six months of continual torture and abuse, I, my mom stepped in and said no more, uh, closed the door, and then I began to deal with the emotional aftermath of that. The, I'll, no one will ever love me, and I, you know, and I just want to die. I never saw myself ever surviving outside of him, and I had just become so lost. I really feel like there was such a void in my life, such a need for a security in God that I needed to sustain me, and I didn't have that. And so that's where I ended up. I ended up in a place where I was desperate for God and needed his help. Wow, that's a lot of trauma for a young girl. And I'm thinking about these men in your life and, and the role model that they were not. Absolutely. Your dad first, Absolutely. and then this young man who takes advantage of you sexually and, and rapes you. And you must have just wanted to give up on on anything male. I, I wanted to give up on life. I, yeah. I felt like there is no real man and there's definitely no real man of God. Mm -hmm. That The church had told me there were men of God, but I was looking for them. Right. I just didn't find them yet. So you actually went to a pastor of a church that you were engaged in? Well, if you back up just a little, sure. at that point when I, my mom was concerned that I was considering suicide, mm -hmm. which obviously I was. I'd become pretty much in a daze most of the day, and I wasn't interacting or eating, and she went to the church for help, and she said, is there anyone that could talk with my daughter? I'm worried. I'm fearful. She may take her life. And so they had a sponsor couple. It was not the youth pastor, but it was a sponsor couple, mm -hmm. a couple who just volunteered to work with the young people, and they asked them if they would mind, you know, just checking on me. So they came over and picked me up and took me to dinner, and then they asked if they could, maybe for the next few weeks on a Tuesday, take me to dinner and just talk with me. And, you know, I thought, well, okay, you know, mom's going to, you know, she's crying. I've got to do something to make her happy, so I'll go. And then, we, you know, we began to interact, and they began to tell me they knew I'd been through some things, and they wanted me to be there for me, and they wanted me to know I could count on them. So. That happened about two, uh, three weeks, and about the fourth week, um, he showed up without his wife to take me to dinner. And um, and again, he was a volunteer, and the church knew him, and Mama said it was great, it was fine. 
so we you know we go out and then eventually it's it's I'm brought into an, a, a relationship with a married man in my church, and he became the controlling factor in my life, the one who decided when I, and I pick up the phone when I get up in the morning, I have to talk before I go to bed. Every moment of my day is controlled and watched by him. He drove around outside my school to make sure I wasn't doing the wrong. I was under his full control, which led into a physical, sexual, spiritual, emotional, every kind of a dysfunctional relationship you could imagine. Uh, he had the keys to the church, and so he would take me there because it was safe, no one would find us. And so I was abused in, in the nursery, in the Sunday school room, in the pastor's office. I mean, it's one of those things that people say this never goes on, but I promise you ladies, it's happening in churches all across America because volunteers are just grooming young women mm -hmm. and young men it's, it's it's a situation that if we don't raise a flag it will continue and so that is what happened after losing all of my teenage years because I lost them all I my childhood years were traumatized and my teenage years were under the control of one human and I I didn't get to go to prom although my mom worked extra hours to make me a prom dress mm -hmm. and it was just one of those things you you can't put into words. The enemy's plan was to destroy my life. And my plan is to pay him back mm -hmm. for every moment he has taken from me. And I'm well on that road. I'm working on it. But I did go to someone in the church finally. I did. I, I realized I could not get out of this by myself. And I had to have help. After, you know, at first, at 15, 14, 15, it's cute. You know, oh, the married man thinks that. But after a while, it was absolute control. I was his prisoner and it was horrendous. And so I ended up going to the pastor. I found out I don't care. The thing he would use to control me, um, both of them was mental torment. Like the first guy would actually hold a gun to my head. This guy would hold a gun to his head. So it's those things where you sit there and you go, no, no, I won't leave out, you know, and it was over and over until I finally said, I don't care what they tell my mom. I don't care what you do. I have to get out of this. So went to the pastor, talked to the pastor, shared with him my heart. I, I need freedom. I need to live my life. I need to find out who am I in Christ and where does this all fit? And is there a God? Because right now, and mm -hmm. the pastor looked across the table at me and said, I, I have to be honest with you, Judy. I, I knew this was going on all along. In, oh in that moment, my heart, my heart had to go, wait a minute. <laughs> all my life, my mama said that the pastor was the man of God, the God man in my life. And he, I would think, because I say Jesus, 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 when I'm afraid that the man representing God would be my protector right. yes. that he would step in and say you know I don't that doesn't look good I need you to you know be away from pastors all over I now have the opportunity to say to them hey these are flags to look for right. if you want to know what's happening in your church first you're gonna have to do some background checks we need to get some processes and some and some priorities in place I, you can have all the talent in the world but I need to know you're not gonna harm the children in my youth and my group. And so anyway, uh, I talked to him, he said he knew that, and I said, well, why didn't you help me? And he looked right into my eyes and said, um, well, let's just say, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. When I heard that, obviously I'm very familiar with the scripture, I understand you know, there's a woman thrown at the feet of Jesus. I get that. I understand. It was almost a condescending term. It was yeah. almost as though, well, there's other people doing it. So, and and in my heart, I'm like, I want to separate the holy from the normal. But I couldn't find the holy in that moment. I tell people, if I found a stone, <laughs> I, I would have been ready to cast it. But it overwhelmed me. But in the long run, he did help me. He did call in the guy and his wife and explain to them the situation. And Did his wife have any idea what was going on? <clears throat> she did. I believe she did. She had actually come to me during that five-year time and said, I'm concerned you may be a little more interested in my husband than, and I wanted so bad to say, no, no, he won't let me go. But I couldn't, I just, mm -hmm. I, 
and I, I assured her, I, you know, the, the deal is I really loved her. And I, I'm like, this is just so emotionally dysfunctional for me. It just was hard. And, uh, but she came in and the pastor at, you know, told her, I don't know if you know, you know, this is going on or not, but this has been going on and she really wants to be, you know, let go. And she looked at him and, and she asked him, is this true? And, you know, he just looked at her angry and then she looked at me and I just started crying because it was a, it was a very hard moment, but it was a moment I had to have to get away from my captive place, to get into freedom. And uh, she was very gracious and she just wanted to go at that time. And the pastor asked him, will you leave her alone? And he looked at me and, and said, is that what you want? And I said, I've told you, <laughs> you know, that's what I want. And um, so from that moment, you know, he, he left me alone. And I said, so just you mentioned that he was a volunteer, but actually reading the news, we know that this happens with staff. We know that it happens with pastors. Mm -hmm. We know that no one is really immune Absolutely. from uh, being tempted or doing the wrong thing. So if there were a listener who was experiencing something similar to this, what would you tell them to do? Immediately tell someone. Find someone that you trust and confide in them what has happened or what is happening, or even if you feel the slightest bit uncomfortable, even if this person has not acted on it, but they're making you feel uncomfortable, speak up now before it's too late. Because not only will you protect yourself, but others that may be in line, right. speak up. If you don't see changes immediately, then you need to go above that, above them, it, whether to a, a board at a church or to a denominational leadership, go above them until you can get someone to see there is a problem here. Usually, immediately when you go to your pastor or your leader, they're gonna say, we're gonna take care of that right now. There's fear of lawsuit, there's fear, there's fear of dishonoring God. I mean, there are God people. There are people who would say, not on my watch. Right. They just weren't present in my life. Does that make sense? Yes. I always say, where were the women of God in the church? Where were the where were the Sunday school teachers, the Bible teachers? Where were you know, why did they not see what was happening in hell? And now I'm able to really challenge leaders as a as a pastor and traveling and speaking and spending time with Patrick. Right. Are you doing background checks? Are you watching? These are flags to watch for. Don't be blinded because it is very prevalent. And you really helped the man himself because you brought to light something that he was trying he to keep really in the dark. Yes. And by bringing it to light, he could get help. And he dealt with it mm -hmm. and God restored it. And restored their marriage and they're great today years later, what, 30, oh man, almost 40 years later. Mm -hmm. And so God has been faithful, faithful, faithful. Was it a hard journey? Yes, yes. yes. But God's been faithful. <clears throat> and he's been faithful because a couple of years after that, he brought Robert into your life. Mm -hmm. Tell yeah. us that good I story. The finest, <laughs> finest man living on the planet, you guys. He's still so fine, I can't hardly stand it. Um, uh, yeah. Robert was actually, I met Robert when he was only 12 years old. He was a drummer in a, uh, in a church where we, I sang and we traveled. And it was while I was just early in this controlling relationship. And we, we were traveling and we were at a church singing and we didn't have a drummer for our little singing group. And I commented, hey, we really need this guy to play the drums for us. He's really good. And so he actually played the drums for several years with us. We traveled all over doing youth rallies and things like that. So I, I actually lived this life and this life all at the same time. Wow. Again, how, how, first of all, does the Lord use broken people? He uses the broken people because when I speak the word, the word of God never returns void. If he can speak through a donkey, he can speak through a broken person. Right. And so a lot of people go, well, I've got to get my myself right before I can speak for God. Okay, I'm not saying to take your brokenness to a platform until you're healed and whole, but I'm saying if God gives you words to speak, 
speak them and he'll honor his word. And he has. So anyway, so this fine looking guy, he's so cute. So he had a crush on me and he wanted me to go out with him all the time. He'd always say, you know, and I would, in order to protect him from the danger I knew he would be in, I was always like, no, I'm not. Tell him I don't babysit because he was younger than I was. I was two and a half years older than him. And so eventually the Lord worked it out in our relationship so that I it's a longer story. I don't really have time to share, but the Lord showed me in a dream a young man standing at the back of the sanctuary, leaning against the wall with one knee up, and I could see him so clearly. The Lord was giving me comfort that he did have a man of God for me, and I did not recognize the man in, in that dream that I'd had. And then in service, I was at the front of the church. I turned around, and there he was, and he was standing there with his leg leaned down, and I was like, <gasps> It's him. <laughs> and he kept asking me, so I told him, I'll sneak and meet with you at McDonald's after church, and we just can't tell anybody. So I fell in love with him that night. I just knew he was so gentle and kind. And I, met, I never had anyone gentle and kind and mm. like that in my life. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, I want this. And God gave him to me, and he has been the biggest gift aside from his restoring life and ex exchanging beauty for ashes, yes. he has covered me with the most awesome man of God you'll ever know. And he has been my safekeeping. Mm. Absolutely. He knows everything and he loves me anyway. Mm. Just like Jesus. Yes. He's good. And Jesus <clears throat> is so good to redeem those places mm, yes. in our life, is he not? Yes, every moment. Oh my goodness. I have to point out you know, when you mentioned that you were living this double life in ministry, but here you are doing these things, mm -hmm. I can so relate. And I look back with utter shame and amazement, Judy, where I was living practically with a boyfriend, mm -hmm. singing on the worship team, mm -hmm. and years later a gentleman comes to me and says, it was during this year I heard you sing, and God really touched do you know that I want to wow. fall on my face yes. now and say, God, how did you use that? Yes. You know. So when we're talking about redeeming, for those of you listening, and Judy's going to keep sharing this amazing story of redemption, but God can redeem anything, anything, anything. And so it just it so touched me, and it reminded me of the goodness of God, and mm. I just had to give Him praise. But awesome. you know, um, and your whole story is not grief, trauma, grief, trauma, but. We do have another season here, Dave. That was really sad. We did. With your child. Would you share with that? There, there were, I mean, it's amazing, uh, moments of great joy. Moments yeah. of great joy in my life. I don't want anyone to think that I, I just lived in a dark cloud all my life. I did have moments in the presence of God where I felt safe. I did have moments of, like, achievement where I felt like maybe I am good. Maybe mm -hmm. I am. I don't know. But... Obviously, we were married, and in about a year and a half, maybe two years later, uh, we married in 81, 83, October of 83, I had a little boy. His name was Brandon Zachary Kennedy, and Zach was the treasure of my life. All of a sudden, everything woke up in me. As a mom, I began to realize, this is a child who will love me because I'm mom, but he will really love me. I don't have to win his love. Mm -hmm. I don't have to earn his love. He just will love me. And it was a, it, it was just such a sweet gift. And God had been gracious. It was a challenging pregnancy, but God was gracious. So uh, we took him in for his two-month checkup. Um, I'm sorry. It was two weeks because he was crying a lot, and he began to turn uh, blue around his mouth. I am a... I mean, intense reader. I grab all of the knowledge I can mm -hmm. everywhere. The word says, in all you're getting, get knowledge. Mm -hmm. So when I found out I was going to be a wife, I read every book I could find on being a wife. And when I found out I was going to have a child, every book about being a child. And that was one of the things I had read, and I knew this is not good. Contacted the doctor, took my, my baby in. My husband at that point was 19, almost 20, very young. Um, and I'm 22, and I, we're sitting across from Dr. David Fixler. I'll never forget the moment. It was Children's Medical Center. We were on the sixth floor in his office. He was the head of cardiac there, or pediatric. And he began to share with us, your son has what we call, um, 
hypoplasia, left heart, and an aortic atresia. He has a hole in his heart, and I had read about that, and I'd heard about that, and that normally they can fix. However, this other thing is that the area of his heart that connects to the valves did not form correctly, and so they could not repair that. So his, his left heart was having to do all of the work to send oxygen to his brain and to mm -hmm. his body. So he cannot live long like that. So immediately I turn, I mean, I know it seems like a long time ago, but they did heart transplant. So I'm like, can we, can we do a heart transplant? I know we don't have insurance, but I'll do anything, whatever we can do. Uh, he said, well, they would normally do that, but because there's nothing formed to connect a heart to, they could not do it. Now, ladies, I'll tell you that now I've done enough research, they now have a way to fix that diagnosis. They didn't then, mm -hmm. but they do now. Uh, he continued to live for a long time. He, they said he would make it another couple of days. He made it two more weeks in the hospital. They said, we're gonna let you take him home and let you just wait for him. He will, you know, he will die, but we're gonna let that happen at home. They sent us home with a bunch of machines that would go off all the time. It was just like a constant torment. We decided to take him off the machines. We're gonna love him as long as we have him. I would hold him and, and rock him, and I want you to imagine again, the damage to your mind and your heart and your mm -hmm. psyche when you're rocking your child going, is he breathing? Is he not? Is he breathing? Is he not? And it was just a, a constant thing. He continued to live till he was one year old. We had a mm -hmm. huge birthday party for him. Mm -hmm. Mama, dad, dad, he was like any other child except he was very weak. So we couldn't let him wear his cell phone. At that party, our friends brought everything. I mean, they brought motorcycle. They brought everything. He never would have it unless God had given us a miracle, which in a very slim part of my heart, I wanted to say, yes, we're going to get a miracle. But every once in a while, that anxiety of, is there a God? That would come back to me. Mm -hmm. Remember all these things? Mm -hmm. Is there a God? You know, the enemy is always going to be there in your darkest moments to whisper to your ear, is there a God? And I am living proof there is a God, and not only is there one, he is a good, good father. He's mm. a good God. So in that moment, uh, he began to, at 13 months, he began to get more and more fidgety and uncomfortable, and they said, we're going to have to go in and relieve the pressure that's built up in his heart. Listen, doctors had come from England, Australia, all over to study him, and so I'm, I'm believing that God allowed him to be a tool for kingdom mm -hmm. purpose. I believe that. But they took him in during that surgery. Uh, he he died during the surgery. And I remember the doctor coming into the room and sharing with the family that he had done all he could do. And I remember the look on my husband's face and the loss in that moment of, God let me down. Mm -hmm. But that's how we feel when we don't understand the grief that overwhelms us, especially during loss. But even Jesus experienced grief so that he could know and be moved by the feelings of our infirmities. He felt what I felt so he could bring comfort to me when I needed it most. Um, in that moment, I had the question, is there a God? And this is where I finally crossed the line where I decided to give God my whole life, my, my whole heart. He died on November 24th, 1984. On December, I'm gonna say it was Christmas Eve. We had a little cheesy Christmas tree in our little apartment set up and I was sitting beside the tree on the floor looking at the lights on the tree and I was asking in my head, what is Christmas even about? Because all the stories I had heard was it was the celebration of Jesus, but I, I couldn't even celebrate. And it's sad to me so many celebrate Christmas without knowing, I mean, having an intense, intimate relationship with Jesus. It just makes the holidays even sweeter. <laughs> but I sat there and I asked, is this all real? Or is this just stories that I've been told all my life? And in that moment, it's as though the presence of God, I'm really sorry, it just moved into the room. And in that moment, he, he saw the brokenness and the questions and the desperation to know, is there a God? And he reminded me of a strategic scripture. Two scriptures. First, he said to me, I gave my only son to come and to live and to die and to raise again so that you 
will see your only son again. Mm -hmm. That is the blessed wow. hope that we all hold on to. Everyone can quote John 3, 16, for God so loved. And when I quote it, it's different. It's not just that he loved me and in my sin, he took my place, but that he so loved me that he made arrangements for me to be with him again, to have the hope of seeing my son again. That awakened in me a, wait, that may be true. And then he reminded me of one more thing. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a trunk, the, the voice of an archangel, and the Lord is going to appear, and he's going to bring us to be with them, meet them in the air, and there we will ever be with the Lord. So every time I face the grief of death, the sting is taken away because of the peace of God mm -hmm. that people cannot understand that keeps your heart and your mind in Jesus. So God has restored me. That is just beautiful. And I know that anytime someone experiences loss, there's a, um, there's a pit in your stomach. There's just this empty feeling. But I've heard that there's no greater loss than that of a child that you brought into the world. But um, to know that you're going to see them again is just such a beautiful thing. And I'm so glad that, that God designed it that way. Let, let me remind you this, and, and those that are listening, God can use every broken place for an open door. Mm -hmm. Just like I said, I get to talk to pastors and I get to talk, I get to visit shelters where women are abused and children are hurting because of dysfunction in the home. I get to walk into the sixth floor of Children's Medical Center and walk in there and hold the hand of a mom mm -hmm. and say, I sit where you're sitting and there is a God. Those things can only, they'll receive from me because I have credibility. Right. Exactly. If we would just begin to, instead of hold on to the pain, begin to say, how can I use this exactly. for God's purpose? And it's opened some doors for me. It's been good. I have a book that I wrote about the grief, Who Washed the Skies, about dealing with grief. There's a hospital that actually sends them home with every family who has lost a child. So it is an opportunity that you you never, if you would have told me I was buying it, I wouldn't mm -hmm. have paid the price. Right. But can I take and turn these things? Can God use them for his purpose? Yes, he can. And I would imagine each encounter is more and more healing and more and more healing and more oh, and yes. more joy that oh, God yes. stirs up within you because he's using that pain yes. to minister to other people, right? Absolutely. And so speaking of um, how God used you yet again to relate to people, you probably never dreamed in your wildest years that you would not go through cancer once, not twice. How many times have you faced cancer now? I have a serious bladder condition in my body. You know, there's an anxiety when you have chronic illness because people don't understand chronic illness. It's a continual thing. And all, all the time you get different diagnoses. I, well, four times was diagnosed with bladder cancer. They say, we're gonna go in, we're going to do these treatments. They're gonna make a difference. The purpose is to burn off a layer in the tissue and it was extremely painful it was a, a a torment and you know it was one of those things had I not began to have sweet time with Jesus time getting to know him and know that he is for me he will not allow this pain to take me he will be there I would not have been able to deal with it because it, it is such extreme pain and in those four times they would go in saying it's cancer we just need to see how bad it is and they would come back out and say and, you know I don't know you must really you know have a God somewhere because this is you know and every time I'm like I'm telling you you can go and look but that's not what it's going to be because God has a plan for my life and he hasn't finished it yet I've got a long way to go baby but I was very ill for a long time I, I had a lot of other issues uh the enemy tried to take me out every way he could, including physically. Inpatient in the hospital 29 times in the span of 10 years. I've had uh, 14 surgeries. I've been through more than most humans, but I can tell you every bit of it has multiplied my trust and my faith in God and the joy of the Lord that has been my sustaining strength. 
I can't, there's no way to make it up. I always tell people, I promise I can document this stuff, but it's like, God, will they believe me anymore? You've just been so good to me. But he has been faithful. It's an amazing story. But I think the reason that God has sustained you is he can trust you with this story. He knows that you will share it. He knows that you will use it for his glory. And so shame on us when we go through hard things and we have these pity parties where it's all about us. Oh, I wish I could tell you I don't, but I want you to know that I'm human yes. and that I still today go through pity parties. I don't stay there as long. <laughs> I'm right. like, are you crazy? <laughs> you don't even have an idea. I mean, can you, you know, there's that one song that says, if you could see where Jesus brought me from to the place I am today, that's scandalous grace. That's the grace that doesn't make sense. But I have to continually remind myself that. So I don't want anyone to feel bad that we do feel that. Where is God? Job even said. Yes. Man, if I could find God five minutes, I would tell him what I think. But Job came back to the same thing we can. That sustaining truth that he knows the way that I take. Even when I can't find him. I've been high and I've been low. And even when I can't find him, he knows where I am. Yes. I continue to lean back into that. Jesus, 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 you know where I am. And he will be faithful. You know, and, and I don't know who's watching the show, but I imagine there might be some people watching who, who really haven't made that commitment to Christ and really don't know some of the things that we're sharing today. For example, the word grace. I mean, I, I know what you mean. Tiffany knows what you mean. But can you define what grace is to maybe a listener who doesn't understand the word grace. Absolutely. I'm, I'm living grace out. I'm a trophy of grace. Uh, I want you to know there's a difference. A lot of people say, oh God, have mercy. And he does. He's a merciful God. His tender kindness and his mercy, it contends with us all the day. But there is something about the grace of God. When I try to figure out the difference, grace is and mercy is not. Now, when someone has mercy on you, it's because you have earned and you deserve a punishment. And they have mercy when they withhold that. So grace is not receiving what you do. I mean, mercy is not receiving what you deserve. But grace, it goes beyond that. And it gives you something you never earned, you never worked for, you cannot make happen. It is something that is a gift from God that we never earn, so we can't even brag or boast about it. The Word of God says that, that He gives more grace where sin abounds. It says that His grace is sufficient in a time of trouble. It says that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. We can find grace to help us when we're in that place where we don't understand how or why God would help us. You're going to go through things that will never make sense to you. Mm -hmm. Maybe you didn't deserve them, but in this world, we will have so many troubles. But God did not say, you will never have trouble. He said, I want you to cheer up, though, because I will be with you, and I have already overcome all of those things. God's grace is something that we can ask for, but he's already offered. It's like the gift that gives and gives and gives, and it's free. That's why I call it scandalous grace. It's something I never earned in all of my sin. I could never pay for, but because of his kindness toward me, he pours it out in abundance on my life, simply because I look to him to sustain me. And he always does. That's good. Thank you for doing that. I know there was a time that you were running and you had a conversation with God. <laughs> Tell us about that. I did. I turned 50 many years ago now. Uh, hmm, almost nine years ago now. I turned 50. And on my 50th birthday, my church, 
bunch of my friends in my church, we all went to the high school in town and we ran a 5K. My first 5K at 50. I should have started doing 5Ks when I was 10, <laughs> but I waited till 50. So at 50, I had trained up to it. I was ready to do it. I'm out there on that field and I'm running around that track and I'm talking to God. My favorite thing to do is talk and my really favorite thing to do is talk to God because <laughs> it's so good. He talks back when I shut up long enough to listen. <laughs> but I was out on that track saying to God, okay, God, look, I'm fixing to be 50. You have brought me through so much, but what now? I'm running out of time. All of a sudden, the realization that my days are numbered, the hair on my head is numbered, the moments of my breathing, it's already settled in his book before I was ever born, so I gotta hurry and live. So I started a long time ago with this motto, I will live, every moment till I die. I will live till I die. And so I'm talking to God about it. What do you want me to do? And he's like, what do you want? And I had to think for a minute, what do I want? Man, when the God of the universe says yes. to you, what do you want? Whoo, hold on, I got a list. <laughs> but just in that moment, I was, I was thinking of my humanness and how fearful I was that I would have lived and never affected my generation. You know, David, the worst is that David, he affected, he influenced his generation, but there's always another generation. And I'm like, I, I have two beautiful daughters, both powerful women of God, both speakers, both travel, both minister. And I know that I have influenced their life, but I want, I said, Oh God, would you give me 50 young women, you know, that I could, you know, just frivolously threw that out, that I could just like speak into their life and, and they would begin to tell their story, like Roaring Lands, that they would begin to share their story and, and lift you up in their generation. And the Lord said, 50? Is that all you want? I'm like, oh, oh, oh no, I don't know, what was I thinking? I mean, 500, would you give me 500? You know, and me, in my little brain, I'm thinking, oh, that would be a big number, 500, God, can I just reach 500 young women? for your kingdom purpose, to, to speak into their lives, to train them, to teach them, to raise them up and send them out to do what I do. And he goes, 500, is that your number? <laughs> Man, I was overwhelmed. I was like, oh, I'm asking too little. Don't ever do that. Yes. Remember, he's the God who created it all. If I wanted something he didn't have, he could make it for me. But I had to allow my mind to dream as big as my God. And so I said, okay, fine. I want 5,000 younger women that myself, I can influence, I can affect, I can transfer something into them for eternity. They would rise up and say, she inspired me to tell my story. And if I can do that, I can change the next generation. I don't want to just be a little ripple in the pond. I want to be a tidal wave. And so from I that think you're moment, a tsunami. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I tried. Yes. I tried real hard, and I began to establish and set up what I call Legacy Five Thousand. Legacy Five Thousand is just an opportunity for one-on-one -on -one connection. I cannot possibly coach five thousand young women. I do coach ten at a time, and I I spend time investing in their their foundations, and then their story, and then their ability to speak and to share their story. And I believe that by the time I go to heaven, I will at least have 5,000. I'm not limiting God to that, you guys. I want 50,000, but I would say, yeah, <laughs> let's get millions, let's get billions, let's give me as many as the right. stars. Right. But I, I really believe that that's the focus of my life. I want to finish well. Mm -hmm. I want to finish well. Mm -hmm. I want him to say, well done. Not, I had so much and you just did this. I want him to say, well done. Come on in and hang out with your son, Judy. <laughs> I I can't imagine that God will not say that to you because right. you are just a powerhouse of Jesus. You mm -hmm. know, that's what makes a difference is the life of Jesus and His Holy Spirit within us. Yeah, it's getting and glory for sure. I'm telling you, your I love the title of uh, well both of your latest books. You've got <laughs> Big Girl Pants, which is your latest, but the other one. Would you tell the brief story behind that's the true. title? It's so great. It's amazing. Did you know you can just be yourself with God? And so I just was, I had written the story. It took, it took me 20 years to sit down and actually write my story. I needed healing and wholeness so that I could share healing and wholeness. And so I began to write, and it was a healing process for me. But as I finished, it took about a year. And when I finished the book, I said, oh, I... I gotta have a name. I have to have this prayer. I got a conference and I gotta finish. I need a name. And I had not really put a lot of thought to the name. So I was walking around in a little cabin where I'd been riding. I was 
talking to God like I do. And when I talk to God, now listen, I'm Judy from the South. I'm born and bred Texan. I have an accent that's heavy and I just talk plain. So I said, God, it's all this crap that happened in my life. And somehow I, you took all of it and you started using it for your purpose. You made, you just made it holy. It's it's all of this, and I'm thinking of my story and him making it holy, and I'm thinking it's all this crap that happened, and all of a sudden it just came all the way around to holy crap. That's what I need to call the book. Now, immediately, of course, I'm like, oh, am I going to sell a book? Am I like, holy crap? But my goal is not to sell a book. My goal is to help people understand that crap is going to happen, but God, who is rich and mercy and full and abundant in grace, he can take all of that and he can scoop it up and use it as fertilizer in the lives of other people. And so in doing that, I went ahead and decided to call it Holy Crap. Now, I do have friends and advisors and people who speak into my life. And one of them, I, I esteem him very highly. Uh, he's a leader in a denomination. He's a brilliant friend and trusted trusted mentor in my life. And I said to him, okay, I'm, I'm calling it Holy Crap. And he's like, you can't, you can't do that because you're going to limit your audience. You can't get into churches using that because they're, you know, I'm like, you know what? I'm trying to reach the lost. I don't, I'm not trying to reach the church. I hope they're found, but saved people should be finding lost people right. and reaching them. And so I want to do that. So he said, well, at least release it under a different name. And then you can take that book into churches. And so I do that now. I I give churches an option. I'd love to come speak for you. I'd love to minister in your church. I can bring all the holy crap, <laughs> or I can bring divine dysfunction and never mention that and make people right. uncomfortable. It's not my decision to offend others. And I Judy, just we only lives. have about a minute left, but the most important part of your story is what you want the listener to do, what you want, how you want them to respond. So why don't you close us out with an invitation okay. that they can call on Jesus okay. and be and become as excited about him as you are. Well, thank you for that opportunity. I'll grab any opportunity I can. There is a God and he will prove himself to you. It does not matter how broken you are. It does not matter what pieces you've lost of yourself. He can recreate the inside of your heart. He can take out all of the broken things, make them whole and put them back in so that you can function and feel and experience life again. The only thing ever required of us is to believe that he is God, that he loved us enough to give his son Jesus, that his son Jesus gave his life for us on a cross, suffered all of the abuse in his body so that we could find wholeness and hope and fullness so that we would not be punished for the state of our life but that we would receive abundant life i call it exchanging beauty for ashes you can live every moment of joy that i live simply by believing in the lord jesus christ that he loves you he cares for you that he has a purpose and a plan for your life even all the broken places and in doing that you can find yourself whole again, and you can use it all for his purpose. Thank you, Judy. Thank you for being a guest Thank on our show. Me. And I know that there are so many of you watching and listening that would just love yes. to reach out to Judy. She is willing to receive your emails, and I am sure she will respond to them. You can email Judy at judy at judykennedy.net. Don't hesitate to reach out to her. Um, you go to her website, judykennedy.net as well. And we'd love to hear from you as well. You can email us at a time to dream at gmail.com. You can even call us on the phone if you have questions about Jesus. So if you want to talk more or know more about Jesus, call us at 972-380-0123. Uh, so I'm Donna Scale, and for myself and Tiffany Ross, you've been listening to A Time to Dream. Thank you for listening today. We hope you have a great week. Keep dreaming, and may God richly bless you.